Welcome to Gas, the true story of a toxic train derailment. I'm Ron Scholl. Last time on Gas, among other revelations on the day the EPA finally had access to the spill site, officials belatedly evacuated the Sawmill Gulch area, inside the official exclusion zone, after ignoring residents' complaints over several days. We now continue with Part 1, Chapter 16, Reassurance. Monday, April 15. As sawmill evacuations took place, officials allowed residents into the exclusion zone for another animal visit. But before site work resumed, a moment of silence was held by the entire worksite crew in memory of the victim found at the wreck site. Smith's death reminded everyone of the threat the gas carried. Around noon, the first transfer began from car one. Chlorine was finally on the move in a controlled process. Liquid chlorine was pumped into a receiving car on temporary track through two one-inch hard pipes under vacuum using a compressor. Any vapor transferred from this closed process was captured and returned to the original car to maintain pressure. Later, the vapor was pumped to a car of liquid sodium hydroxide to neutralize it. The techs considered how to tackle car 3. They wanted to separate cars 4 and 5 from car 3 to see the hole then patch and roll car 3 to level it for offloading. Normally, they said, the patching procedure consists of using a chemical material to try and cover the hole. Then the device is used to clamp the patch. Normally, meant a small hole. Current wind puffed from the east, but a front would arrive in the evening, bringing stronger southwest winds, shifting the threat. In the belly of the beast, everyone needed level A or B protection. Minutes of the April 15 evacuee meeting were not documented, but the MRL handout assured the accident site remains stable and the technical teams continue removing chemicals. The EPA's Chris Weiss assured the audience that chlorine gas would leave no residue behind in Alberton. Three chemicals were announced as spilled. Chlorine, sodium chlorate, and potassium crestlate solution, spent, which is liquid, not detected in the air at levels of concern, they said. Some has flowed into a nearby ditch where it remains in the soil at this time. While some 17,000 gallons had flowed, information about the Cresolate trickled. The meeting's message was general reassurance, but Perel and Leahy's notes, Weiss added that with the Cresolate and chlorine, some possible reaction at time of spill, not know yet, we'll look at later. The next day, this product was correctly identified in the Missoulian for the first time. Potassium crestlate was the industry name given to a solution that variously contained either potassium hydroxide or sodium hydroxide as a base, and crestlate, in turn made up of various phenols. Its industrial use was to clean gasoline or natural gas. After each use, it became a recyclable waste, potassium crestlate solution spent, replete with various toxic contaminants, including mercaptans. To date, the chemical solution drew scant attention from the public since the car reportedly had leaked, quote, only slightly and very locally, or a minuscule amount and some, that the majority of the tank had spilled would not be reported in the Missoulian until 1997. Also not publicized was that the Cresolate spilled directly next to the leaking tank of chlorine. An odor description was not reported. Such basic information would have raised many questions, as evacuating and visiting residents had complained of a pesticide-like or sulfur smell. Some residents already asked, what was in this other spilled chemical? The assurance this day was that, though fresh releases of chlorine gas continued, no chemicals related to the spill would affect the residents in the partial re-entry zone or during visits into the exclusion zone. On health concerns, Dr. Walter Peschel reported to hundreds of evacuees that the patients he had seen improved considerably over the weekend. Peschel had never before treated victims of chlorine exposure, the Missoulian reported. Some people still have a dry cough, but the lung functions are back, he said. Peschel explained that people with normal lungs and mild chlorine exposure recovered in usually less than a week. For those people with pre-existing lung disease, asthma, or emphysema, Things are a little tougher, he cautioned, but if their exposure was mild, they too should recover. Prognosis was less certain for those people with the most serious exposures, identified here as those few in intensive care at area hospitals. They could develop a reactive airway syndrome like asthma that could last for several months, Peschel said. 
these patients could develop permanent lung damage or completely recover. This was the first published mention of reactive airways in reference to the spill. The general assumption was that evacuees had mild exposures, with the possible exception of those caught on the highway and the people on the train. The key message, almost everyone should be fine in a week or less. At the time of the Alberton spill, the EPA's official stance on chlorine exposure was, quote, if one survives acute exposure to chlorine, recovery is usually complete and rapid. St. Patrick's Hospital updated having treated 167 people. More than half the patients came after the second morning of the spill, revealing a pattern of delayed symptoms and or delayed visits. The symptoms, they said, like a cough, may not show up until a few days after the exposure. People with even moderate exposure might have symptoms of coughing, wheezing, burning eyes and stomach, and vomiting for up to two weeks. Though severe acute injury was possible and potentially lethal at high exposure levels, there seems to be few long-term effects, St. Patrick said. Three general health categories had emerged in the local record. Mild exposure, with symptoms abating in days, at most one week. Moderate exposure, with symptoms lasting up to two weeks. And severe exposure, with symptoms possibly lasting months or even resulting in permanent lung damage, such as reactive airway syndrome. Those people with pre-existing respiratory conditions could take longer to recover. But with the assumption that few people had received severe exposures, the message became that most everyone should be fine in two weeks or less. Specifically, 15 patients had been hospitalized. The most serious case, Australian Cook Chun Lee, was upgraded from critical to serious. Lee reportedly had post-incident pulmonary edema. Sharon Miller was still in intensive care on a ventilator. The Millers, Lee, and asthmatic Roxanne Zymet would be the last to be released. Delayed and continuing symptoms expanded visits to the emergency room. The NTSB later listed one fatality, 123 serious injuries, including two response workers, and 229 minor injuries, 353 total. They also listed 650 other evacuated people as having no acute injury, presumably because they did not see a doctor or emergency center. So immediately, one assumption developed that 65% of those evacuated had no injury. But lack of medical treatment did not mean someone experienced no acute symptoms. Some reassurances apparently came as a reaction to the volatile chemistry of evacuee emotions. University of Montana student Hope Seek first attended an evacuee meeting around April 15. Seek, a UM graduate student in environmental studies, took interest in the evacuees as a student activist in chlorine issues. She recalled her first evacuee meeting vividly and painted a picture unlike anything portrayed in the media or sparse logs. Seek, it was a huge room, and at the front of the room was a banquet table with four people in suits behind it and the rest of the room was just filled with people who hadn't changed their clothes in five days, and babies screaming, and people coughing, and people's eyes were red and running from chlorine burns. Some people had visible chemical burns on their faces. You could see this room filled with people whose lives had been ripped apart, and they didn't really understand the extent of it yet. And these people up front with their prepared statements were trying to tell everybody that everything was okay. That's definitely what the message was. Don't worry, everything is fine. We've got it under control. They looked at these people, most of whom had been to the emergency room, as this horde that was about to go out of control. They knew that these people had been terribly wronged. If they didn't say the right thing, they could turn on them and be an angry mob. On the fifth day, a new concern arose over secondary chlorine exposures. A back page story in April 16th, Missoulian, mentioned that an Alberton mother complained to Ellen Leahy that some children had skin rashes and irritated eyes after swimming in public pools and hot tubs. Leahy reported that children might still have, quote, irritation from their chlorine exposure, and swimming in a chlorinated pool or hot tub might increase irritation or even initialize symptoms for the first time. She advised that people with these symptoms avoid exposure to chlorine until fully recovered. But to answer the woman's concerns, Leahy had to consult with allergist Dr. Donald Gillespie. Leahy noted at the time, quote, Per Gillespie could be hypersensitive, at least makes sense to avoid re-exposure to chlorine in the immediate aftermath. 
Leahy recalled, Here's kids who had been exposed to chlorine, and now they're dipped into a chlorinated pool. That's that sun-on-sunburn kind of thing. Leahy claimed it's common sense for Alberton spill victims to avoid chlorine exposure in swimming pools. Yet, she had called Gillespie for a medical explanation. Leahy, hypersensitivity is used by all the medical toxicologists. Basically, the majority of people would not get the sensitivity response, some people would get the response, and the injured people are more likely to get the response. Okay? It's not a quantifiable term. The swimming pool report brought to mind the earlier evacuee complaint of reactions. The Alberton mother's concern produced the first published recognition from a health official concerning symptoms to any secondary exposure to chlorine, even a common one such as chlorinated pool water. Leahy explained what she had meant by a secondary exposure initializing certain symptoms. I got that from Gillespie, she said, that you haven't had an allergic or hypersensitive reaction yet, but now you're primed. It wasn't necessarily a delayed reaction. It's just that you didn't have enough to give you that sensitivity on the first exposure, but now you did, she said. On the fifth day of the spill, this common sense advisory to avoid common chlorine exposures came only after complaints, a reactionary response. On April 17, St. Patrick's Hospital updated. Persons who are exposed to chlorine, they said, such as in a swimming pool or a hot tub, may experience a renewed outbreak of symptoms. The EPA had not warned of hypersensitivity to chlorinated pools either, yet Chris Weiss later claimed, We anticipated that. The pool is sanitized with chlorine. If it didn't cause reactive airway distress in some of those kids, it certainly reminded them of the unsettling experience of the evacuation. Weiss figured the chlorine level just above pool water would be about one part per million. They went into the pool and they got enough chlorine to send them into a hypersensitivity reaction, he said. And several of those kids went to the doctor. They hyperreacted to what normally wouldn't have bothered them. Such reaction was expected, Weiss claimed. Absolutely. And I think there were a number of people who complained of symptoms that were very consistent with reactive hypersensitivity. And yet, like the concern over people with pre-existing respiratory illness visiting Alberton, the pool warnings were only publicized post-complaint, not proactively. If such reactions were expected, officials were negligent in giving warnings. Residents, children who went to the doctor, were bellwethers. Notably, the term sensitivity or hypersensitivity were not used in the above media report or documented from the day's public meeting. Publicly, Leahy referred to skin and eye irritation and implied that it was a short-term issue. At this point, a public discussion of hypersensitivity and all its implications had not begun. By April 15, many evacuees had experienced reactions to chlorinated environments in Missoula, including respiratory symptoms. At the motel of Sear resident White, she said, It was harder to breathe when you went into the swimming pool area. It was that weight just like it was taking more effort to breathe. We went into the swimming pool and we were both, God, why is it that we are both suddenly feeling sick? Oh, duh, it's the chlorine. It's that hypersensitivity to the chlorine. Jenny Gradbo of Sawmill Gulch said that her younger siblings went swimming afterwards at the motels when they were evacuated, and they broke out in rashes and stuff like that, she said. Terry Stewart of Ponderosa Acres testified that the motel pool and hot tub area irritated her and caused a severe body rash. Her acute respiratory symptoms from April 13 soon developed into a lung infection. Kurt McComb of Plateau Road reacted strongly at his motel. It damn near knocked me out, he said, the chlorine in the pool, the hot tub. My face turned flush, my ears got hot, just like that. The Criscos and Finnemans of Alberton also recalled sensitivity to pools. During her family's evacuation from Alberton, Sandy Halbert noticed a pesticide-like smell. The only time Halbert definitely smelled chlorine was near their motel pool. The spill was a different smell to me, she said, but that poolside chlorine definitely bothered me. When her kids used the hot tub once, their skin burned. Catherine Denoud of Roscoe Road said her children showed immediate chlorine sensitivity after evacuation. They finally did say Alberton people shouldn't be around the chlorine, she said. That was after almost every kid in town swam in Ruby's Inn swimming pool, which is an indoor pool, and got rashes. My kids got rashes over their bodies, like red bumps all over them. And then it was like, oh yeah, I thought things were really lame, she said, referring to belated health warnings. Common sense, 
dictated proactive health warnings. Sensitivity was barely on the radar as officials planned for residents to again visit the exclusion zone on April 16. While residents with livestock visited again Monday, today residents had a three-hour window to go into their homes, feed pets, and retrieve belongings. In their April 15 handout, MRL now warned people with pre-existing lung conditions should not go into the evacuated areas at this time. The new restriction implied visitors might react to something particular in the Alberton environment. There were complaints by people that went in and came back out, Leahy recalled. We wouldn't expect reactions going back in, but we're hearing of reactions going back in. So what ought we to do, we thought. Leahy elaborated somewhat. We had various types of complaints of people believing they had secondary exposures and a renewal of or additional symptoms. Weiss acknowledged that the people with pre-existing lung conditions restriction was a response to complaints. There were reactions, he said, and that's actually common for acute chlorine exposure. It causes sort of a hypersensitivity, a reactive airway hypersensitivity, and we saw that very clearly, particularly in some of the children It was recommended that children not go back in. Hopefully, people didn't take their kids back in. But the record did not reflect any warnings against children to visit. And if there was no residual chlorine and the visits were considered safe from new gas releases, what could people react to? I don't think anybody was exposed during that time, Weiss said. I think the visits came across without any incident whatsoever. This implied that the reported reactions and complaints to visiting the Alberton area had nothing to do with the chemicals involved, at least physically. Hypersensitivity to visiting the Alberton area per se was not expected, and no hypersensitivity warning was given. Evacuees were told all was safe. As for why take the risk at all of letting people back in, Weiss pointed to the animals. But officials allowed pets and livestock to be left behind, enabling continued and repeated visits. Officials announced that evacuees would be allowed into the exclusion zone again on Wednesday to feed livestock, and another pet visit was planned for Thursday. The immediacy of rescuing animals left behind had given way to allowing people back to the exclusion zone almost daily, and if they chose, they could leave animals behind, necessitating continued visits. Health complaints were effectively dismissed. Did Leahy think people sensitized to chlorine could have reactions from going back to visit, or was there simply no risk of exposure? Leahy, we believe that with the possible exception of a possible pocket, that there was nothing to expose them to. But the fact that they quit working on the tank and had chlorine monitors didn't mean that the tank wouldn't do something, you see. But if the concern was a fresh release, a warning concerning sensitivity seemed as warranted as MRL's warnings for asthmatics. It seemed risky to allow anyone back to visit. I wasn't there, Leahy said, referring specifically to the April 13 animal rescue. And first of all, Leahy said, nobody for pet reentry was forced to go back, but the pressure from those who wanted to go back for livestock and pets was immense. But people were allowed to come back again and again after April 13, and releases of chlorine continued, oftentimes unpredictably. But they didn't keep visiting, Leahy insisted. They had people part of incident command doing the livestock feeding after that. Similar to Jess Mickelson's belief years later that we never let anyone go into their homes, no one went into Alberton for 17 days, Leahy didn't recall that responders only did feeding in the designated hot zone, and residents were regularly allowed scheduled visits to the exclusion zone. Okay, she said, then I don't have accurate information on that then you have different information than I recall. I knew there was some feeding, but I didn't know or didn't remember that some of the citizens themselves were doing it, she said. But resident visits did continue, routinely. It's possible that was part of the operation I wasn't exposed to, Leahy claimed. Yet the visits were openly announced and documented, and the main task of the health department was public health. Waldron said he received input from Leahy and Weiss concerning the ongoing visits. We looked to the technical experts, to the hazmat team, to the health department, to provide information, he said. We made our decisions based on that information. Everyone decided the visits were safe, he said. There was no warning about sensitivity reactions for visitors to Alberton. Hypersensitivity reactions to chlorinated pools and home visits had not been expected. 
officials followed the lead of complaints. Meanwhile, while officials didn't believe visitors were being exposed to contamination, they had yet to address the source of reported smells, such as pesticides. Leahy made a note today, quote, Alberton smell, can smell. Then Leahy crossed out, can smell. The text reported at 6 p.m. that car one was still flowing and without leaks. They estimated half the load was transferred. Light towers would be set up to illuminate the site and a night shift established. The text modeled some gas release scenarios. The worst case scenario showed the chlorine taking 10 minutes to reach the forward operations post with a 7 mile per hour wind. The worst case scenario would be failure of one of the remaining pressurized tanks, another catastrophic release. Spilled chlorine in the soil was also a concern, so a line was laid between car 3 and the empty Cresslade tank. The techs hoped the line would help neutralize chlorine when car 3 was churned and soil stirred up, in preparation to patch the hole. The forecast calls for rain and possible thunderstorms by tomorrow afternoon, the techs noted. The rain would make the situation worse because the water supplies heat. Heat to melt the ice. For now, it was extremely dry, and the tech said there was a lot of dirt blowing around, including lime dust, so workers would wet down the site where they had applied lime. But water supplied heat, as the text had just noted. Around 7.45 p.m., water was applied to the lime, which caused a high volume of gas production, the text said. Water application was stopped. At the time, Marine measured a direct reading of chlorine at the east hot zone barrier greater than 50 parts per million, the limit of the monitor. Despite winds from the northwest, readings at the north barrier on Reardon Lane hit 3 to 5 parts per million. Chlorine readings remained high two hours later. Missoula Hazmat's Tom Ziegler recalled a spike around this time. A few days into the spill, while he was on site, they did have a 60 part per million alarm go off, he said. And at that point, everybody was ordered out and we deconned them. I was there and remember it. 60 parts per million is extremely high for chlorine. The severity of the reaction was unanticipated. The text decided no more lime. The industry experts had been taken by surprise as they added another chemical and water to the mix. Here on April 15, the text again, quote, negotiated with EPA for entry and review of transfer operation. That evening, the text noted, the EPA will be included in the meetings from now on. He will not be a speaking member. He's just here to listen. Steve Way recalled, they may perceive they have some ability to restrict what my opinions are and how I voice them or whatever it is, but that's just a figment of their imagination. I don't argue with them about it. I just don't waste my time with it. In effect, there wasn't any constraint on my ability to impart my opinion. I represent EPA and the response authority provided for by CERCLA, not their technical team. CERCLA was the Comprehensive Environmental Response, Compensation, and Liability Act, also known as Superfund. Way went to the site and spoke up as he wished. During his April 18 report, Way first wrote that he was part of the technical group. According to Weiss, the EPA became a de facto member of Unified Command, because they had supreme authority over a Superfund incident. That evening, Watts announced at the IC briefing, the rolling procedure on CAR-3 will begin at 8 a.m. Rolling was a crucial maneuver as it could trigger a large gas release. All personnel at Forward Ops at the Natural Pier Bridge might be removed in advance. Around midnight, after some 13 hours of moving liquid chlorine from CAR-1, transfer was stopped for the night. Cars 1, 2, and 4 would be offloaded to about half their load, then leveled prior to resumption of offloading. Slowly, chlorine was on the move, in a good way. Next time on Gas, the true story of a toxic train derailment, more residents push back against assurances of safety, increasingly concerned about their long-term health and the chemical smells in the Alberton area during visits. Until then, this is Ron Scholl. Thanks for listening. This podcast is adapted from the book Gas, the true story of a toxic train derailment. Visit Amazon.com to see the two-book series. To access support material in the book, such as maps, photos, illustrations, and video links, visit my Facebook page Gas, the true story, or watch my Gas playlist on my YouTube channel at R.L. Scholl.